All right. Well, thank you very much for being here tonight. <clears throat> I really appreciate you coming. And of course, I want to start by saying thank you to uh, Pastor Mrs. Burzens for all of the hospitality. It's been a, a wonderful trip. I've got notes that are bigger than this uh, little pulpit here. I don't know what to do with it. But um, it's been a wonderful trip. The hospitality, the meals, the, the, the food has been great. And we really appreciate I know all the work that goes into an event like this. If it's okay, I'm going to close this and put this here. In case you're wondering, I've got my verses in my notes, all right? So I'm not <laughs> forsaking the Word of God. And uh, it's been a wonderful trip. I appreciate being able to see all, all my friends, Pastor and Mrs. Thompson and Pastor and Mrs. Shelley and Pastor Robinson. And uh, I just met uh, Pastor Ed Williams, uh, Sword of the Spirit Baptist Church. That's a good name. Amen. And you've got a good cr crowd with you. Appreciate you being here. And, of course, appreciate everybody here tonight. Thank you for being uh, here. I realize it's almost 9 p.m., but uh, I'll, I'll try not to keep you too long. If you're there in Acts chapter 16, if you look at verse number 6, the Bible says, Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mycenae, they essayed. The word there means they determined or attempted to go into Bithynia. Notice the Bible says, but the Spirit suffered them not. That word suffer, it's an older word. We don't use it in our uh, modern day vernacular. It means allowed. The Bible says there that the Spirit suffered them not, meaning the Spirit did not allow them. And what we see in this passage is we see that God is trying to get Paul uh, to the right place to preach the gospel. Paul, God, uh, God's trying to get Paul into the place where he's going to be the most effective, where there's going to be the most reception, and he's uh, wanting to go to these uh, places, and God, the Bible says, if you look at verse 6 again, were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Uh, he says in verse 7 that the Spirit suffered them not. Notice verse 8, and they passing by Mycenae came down to Troas. Notice these words, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after they had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And this is, of course, the famous Macedonian call. And this is uh, a big event in the life of the Apostle Paul because God, the Holy Spirit, suffered him not. He was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to go to Asia, which, you know, we find now, we understand many years later, uh, is, is an unreceptive place. But yet he went into Macedonia. He went into the land of, 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 of Greece and, and Europe in that uh, section. And of course, Course, had much success there and it's interesting because obviously Paul was a man that God used to write most of the New Testament Paul was someone that the Holy Ghost uh, uh, used to speak and to write the words of God but God here instead of speaking to 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 uh, Paul he sends a vision if you notice there again in verse 9, he says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And it uh, seems like maybe it was a dream, but he, he sees a man. It, he says, uh, There stood a man of Macedonia, praying him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. It's interesting to me that God chose the image of a man. Now, I don't know if this was a, a literal person that was actually alive or just a man that represented the Macedonians. I'm sure he was dressed maybe like the Macedonians were dressed or whatever it might be. But God used the vision of someone saying, Come and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us forth to preach the gospel. It's interesting that God gives Paul a vision of what we would presume to be an unsaved man, a man that's not saved. And we see this unsaved man calling Paul to come preach the gospel in his area. And tonight I'd like to preach to you on the subject of the call of the unsaved. You may not realize it or maybe you haven't noticed it, but throughout the Bible we'll see certain unsaved people that they call and they're calling uh, for someone to bring them the gospel and we see them getting saved. In fact, right there in Acts chapter 16, if you look down at verse number 
30, Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, we have that famous uh, passage of the, uh, uh, of the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, the Bible says there, and brought them out and said, Sirs, notice here we have an unsaved man. And notice the question he asked. He says, What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. So we see that there are these unsaved. I'd like to speak to you just for a few moments tonight on the subject of the call of the unsaved. And maybe you can jot these notes down. I realize we're at a camping trip, but if you've got a pen or something to write with, I'd encourage you to uh, write these things down. Keep your place there in Acts. Uh, we're going to come back to it. But go with me one book back to the book of John, if you would. John chapter number 12. I'd like you to notice... The call of the unsaved. In John chapter 12, we have this story, and of course we're, we're rewinding a little bit from the time of uh, Paul to the time of Christ. This is during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 12, verse 20, the Bible says this, And there were certain Greeks... There were certain Greeks among them. Now I want you to notice the Greeks are obviously non-Jewish Gentiles. And they're among them, among whom? Among the Jews. The Bible says, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. I want you to notice, it is a Jewish feast. You've got these Greek Gentiles coming to worship at a feast, and obviously these guys were curious. They're looking for something. They're searching for something. They don't even know what they're looking for. They just realize they don't have it. They need the truth. And isn't it isn't true that our churches, our type of churches, are filled with people that were once unsaved looking for the truth? Yeah. I mean, that's why you started looking up all those weird documentaries that Pastor Shelley was talking about, right? That's why you started looking into all those weird conspiracy theories. That's why you started, you know, uh, listening and, and trying to learn. And, of course, God used that to bring you to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. who is the truth. He, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Here we have these men, they're Greeks, they're Greeks, and they are in this, at this feast, and they're uh, just there, they're curious, they're looking, they're searching. Notice verse 21, the same, referring to the Greek Gentiles, came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, now I want you to notice the next five words. I love these words. In fact, if you don't mind writing in your Bible, I'd encourage you to underline these words in your Bible or maybe circle these words in your Bible. I want you to notice these five words. These, are, may, these may be five of the most encouraging words in the Bible. I want you to notice these Greeks, all right? I'm sure they stood out in the crowd. They're not Jews. They're not Jewish. They're at this Jewish feast. They're just kind of there. They're just kind of looking. They're just kind of interested. They're just kind of curious. While they're there, they happen to hear about this other guy named Jesus. People are talking about Jesus. People are gossiping about Jesus. They're talking about the fact that he's healed people, about the fact that he's taught great parables. And they get kind of curious, and they go and find one of the disciples of Jesus, and they, they, they give this statement. They said, Sir, we would see Jesus. I want you to notice that there are people out there who are searching for the truth. Amen. Just like these Greeks. Just like these Greeks we read about, there are people out in our communities, in our cities, in our neighborhoods, unsaved people. They're not even saved. They're just kind of searching. They're not even saved. They're just kind of looking. They're not even saved. They just know they're missing something. They're not even saved. They just know that their church and their religion and their message is not really the truth. They just understand that there needs to be, there should be something there. And those people, not even really knowing what they're asking or what they're looking for, they said, Sir! we would see Jesus Amen. That, th those words that they said we want to see Jesus we would like to see Jesus Amen. here's what they were saying they were saying if you would introduce us to Jesus we'd sure like to meet him Amen. you know that there's unsaved people out there seeking for Jesus right. they may not know it but they're seeking for something right. go with me back to the book of Acts if you would Acts chapter number 10 let me give you another example Acts chapter number 10 there are people out in the world today that are seeking for something. And I'd like to give you the first point tonight is this, the call of the unsaved. The call of the unsaved is for us to seek those that are seeking. Acts chapter 10, look at verse 1. Let me give you another example. Acts 10, 1, the Bible says this, There was a certain man of Caesarea called Cornelius, 
a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Again, a Gentile. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This is a very religious man, but we'll see he wasn't saved. By the way, just because somebody's religious doesn't mean they're saved. Just because somebody prays doesn't mean they're saved. Just because someone goes to church doesn't mean they're saved. Notice verse 2. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Notice verse 3. He saw a vision. Evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now I want you to notice, the angel doesn't preach the gospel to him because the ministry of reconciliation has not been given to angels. Right. Notice what the angel says, verse 5, And now send men to Joppa, and call for a one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth there with one Simon a Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Here we have Cornelius, a man who's obviously seeking. He's searching. He's looking for something. He's saved. He's on his way to hell, but he knows that there's something out there. Go with me to the book of Luke, if you would. You go back past the book of John into the book of Luke. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses, notice verse number 10. Luke, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the Bible says this, For the Son of Man. Notice the mission statement of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus come to this earth to do? The Bible says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to seek that which was lost. And by the way, the Bible tells us that we are then to do, as Jesus said, as my Father sent me, even so send I you. You know, the truth is this, that you and I should be seeking for those that are seeking. We should be looking for those that are looking. In fact, the call of the unsaved, the call of the unsaved, the unsaved, they'd say, Sir, we would see Jesus, and our job is to look for those that are looking for Jesus. Amen. There's a movement of liberal churches out there. It was started by a man named Rick Warren. A, a movement of churches called Seeker Sensitive Church. It was really made popular by Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Church. And Rick Warren wrote this book and he started this seeker-sensitive movement where he basically taught people that the way you get churches to grow and to succeed is, is you want to create these seeker-sensitive churches. And they would go to an area to plant a church and what they'd do is they'd send these surveys out to the community. And these surveys would ask people certain questions. That, what kind of music do you like? How do you like to dress? You know, where do you like to spend your time? These different things. And then they would take back these surveys. And if everybody in the community said, you know, we all like country western music, then they would say, all right, well, when you start your church, start it with country western music. And if they, you know, like hip hop, then you want to start with some Christian rap. Or if they like rock and roll, and have rock and roll, you know. And if they like to dress with, uh, I don't, you know, I don't. This is my first time in Georgia. I don't know if this is a Georgia thing, but if they like to wear big belt buckles and ha and and cowboy hats and and boots, and you know, make sure your pastor has on a big belt buckle and a cowboy hat and and boots. And if they like to, you know, wear baggy pants and 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 uh, look, you know, like thugs, then make sure your pastor looks like a thug. And they start this seeker sensitive uh, uh, movement. And let me say this: we should be against. Seeker sensitive churches. Yes. Right. We, should have, we should have savior sensitive churches. Right. We should have churches that are interested in pleasing and being honoring to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to unsaved people. Right. Obviously, we're against seeker sensitive churches, but I would say this, we ought to have some seeker sensitive soul winners. Right. We have some soul winners that are out there seeking for those that are seeking. Let me just tell you something. I'm against this type of soul winning that says, you know, you knock on a door, somebody opens the door, and then your attitude is just, I'm just going to start preaching the gospel till they cuss me out and slam the door in my face. You know, why, you know I, I, I'm just going to preach the gospel. I'm going to put my foot in the door. And when they start to try to shut it, my foot's going to be in the way. I'm just going to keep preaching the gospel. You know, why would you want to do that? Right. right. You know, while you're sitting there and arguing with somebody, those of you who like to go out soul winning and argue 45 minutes with every Jehovah's Witness, 
you run into every morning. I'm going to show them. While you're sitting there arguing with some false prophet or while you're sitting there, you know, just jamming it down the throat of somebody that doesn't want to hear it, there might be somebody down the street who is saying, hey, I would see Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, I, what must I do to be saved? What, what, what has to happen here? The truth is this. There are people who are seeking and we ought to be seeking those that are seeking. Amen. We should be looking for those that are looking for Christ. We should be looking for the unsaved Amen. that wants to hear, Amen. that is receptive. It's the call of the unsaved to seek. There's unsaved people out there that are hoping that you'll come and bring them the truth. There's unsaved people out there, and look, you, we, we need to find them. We need to look for them. We don't need seeker-sensitive churches. We do need seeker-sensitive soul winners. Let me give you uh, a, a couple of verses. You don't have to turn here. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. Notice how Paul was a seeker-sensitive soul winner. Here's what he said. He said, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, of course, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. He said, I made all things to all men, that I by my own means save some. Amen. So what does that mean? That means we should go and seek for those that are seeking. Let me ask you something. When's the last time you went out and you're in a community and you started looking for somebody that was looking? When's the last time you knocked on a door and said, if I could show you how you could know for sure that you're on your way to heaven, would you be interested in hearing it? Now maybe they said, no, I'm not interested. And I, I try to be polite and say, well, look, on the back of our invitation, there's a, a video here on YouTube. It explains how you can know for sure. If you decide you're interested, I encourage you to check it out. But you know what? I'm moving on because I'm trying to find the person that's looking right. for something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to search for the one that's looking. See, we should be seeking and saving like Christ. Go, go back uh, go to Luke chapter 15. You're there in Luke 19. Flip back to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. You say, Pastor Jimenez, I don't, you know, I, I don't understand the soul winning thing. You know, you guys go out there and you knock on doors and, and you, you print out maps and you highlight the maps and you try to knock every door in a city or knock every door in an area. Why would you do that? Here's why we do that, because we are looking for those that are looking. Amen. We are seeking for those that are seeking something. There's unsaved people out there. Like Cornelius. who are praying. They're seeking after something. They're seeking after God. They know something's not right. And we're supposed to go out and to seek and to save that which we're lost. We should be seeking. Luke 15, look at verse 3. Here we have a parable. In Luke 15, is the, you've got the parables of those things which are lost. You have the lost sheep. You have the lost coin. Then you have the lost son, the prodigal son. In Luke 15 and verse 3, the Bible says this, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which was lost, until he find it? And when he found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And let me just stop here for a minute and remind all of us that soul winning is not the Great Commission. You say, Pastor, you're mad as I understand. I thought you were preaching about soul winning. I am preaching about soul winning. But please understand something. Soul winning is not the Great Commission. Soul winning is only part of the Great Commission. Now, it's the first part. I would say it's the most important part, but it is not the Great Commission. When you go soul winning, you're not fulfilling the Great Commission. The Great Commission is go you therefore into all the world and uh, preach the gospel to every creature. That means that we are to go and teach all nations, preach the gospel to every creature. But it also means that we are to baptize them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them, number three, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Great Commission is that we go and reach people. We bring them to church and baptize them. And then we disciple them in the things of God. The Great Commission is not fulfilled through a soul winning marathon. I'm not against soul winning marathons. We have soul winning marathons. I love soul winning marathons. But the Great Commission is fulfilled. It's fulfilled in, in one institution, the local church. Amen. Amen. And when we go out and we seek that which was lost, we're fulfilling the first part part of that commission but let me remind you soul winners part of that is bring them in I mean look there verse 5 and when he hath found it 
right? The, 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 the man who, having a hundred sheep and lost one, he went on the wilderness to go after that which is lost. And when he hath found it, notice, he layeth it on his shoulder rejoicing. He puts it on his shoulder and brings it in. Let me just tell you something for you soul winners. So, yes, let's go get them saved. Let's go seek those that are seeking. But when you go and you knock the doors and you look for the one that's looking for something and you bring them the truth and you get them saved, don't just high five them there and say, all right, see you in heaven. Sometimes you got to put them on your shoulder and bring them back. Let's get you baptized. Let's get you discipled. Let's get you like Pastor Shelley preached. Great sermon tonight. Like Pastor Shelley preached. Let's get you in church. Because when church, you're going to learn to do the good works. Sometimes we got to bring them in. Sometimes we got to go the extra step. Just this uh, last uh, week, my wife was out soul winning and she uh, got somebody saved on, on, on a Saturday. She got somebody saved a couple weeks ago uh, on a Saturday and she talked to the guy and he uh, 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 seemed real excited and he got saved and, 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 and he seemed very receptive about coming to church and uh, of course she uh, got down his information and she wrote down his name and his address and asked him for permission to follow up with him. And look, let me tell you something. It's a sad thing when we go out soul winning we get somebody saved and we don't even remember the person's name. How you can pray for them? We're all excited, high fiving ourselves. Hey, God wants to say, God wants to say. Oh, what's their name? Oh, I don't know. Well, how, how are you gonna pray for him? And she wrote down his information, and 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 he was gonna come to church the next day. We're also winning on Saturday, and he didn't he didn't come. And she was telling me, she was saying, man, you know, he really seemed like he was going to come. I'm really kind of surprised. I, honestly, and obviously they always seem like they're going to come, but this one actually seemed like he was going to come. And she remembered in the conversation that they'd had, he mentioned that it was his birthday that week. And she decided to go out. And, and, and the first time she talked to him, she said, hey, we can pick you up for church. We can bring you to church. And he's like, yeah, you know, I really want to come and all these things. She remembered it was his birthday on Thursday, so she baked some cookies she went with my son back to his house on, on his birthday and said, hey, we brought you some cookies for your birthday. I remember you said it was your birthday. He was really impressed with that and how thoughtful it was that she remembered that. And he said, we missed you in church on Sunday. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I really wanted to come, you know, and he's just kind of sh being shy. And she said, well, what's, what's the problem? If you want to come, you know, what's the problem? And he said, I, I just need a ride. And she said, we can get you a ride. We'll pick you up. Went by and picked him up for church on Sunday. He came to church last night. Uh, I was here. I wasn't in church on Wednesday night, but uh, one of the men of our church went by and uh, picked him up for church. Hey, here, here's all I'm telling you is that sometimes you got to put them on your shoulder and bring them with you. Sometimes you got to put in the effort uh, uh, to look for those that are looking. Look, when somebody's out there and they're searching for the truth, when somebody's out there and they're looking for the truth, don't just forget about them. Bring them the gospel, the call of the unsaved is to seek. And let's not forget them. Let's remember them. Let's bring them back. Psalm 126, you have to turn there. The Bible says this, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Don't forget this, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. At our church, the Lord has, has blessed us, and this is all glory to God. The Lord has blessed us on an on a average week. Our church has about 100 soul winners that go out every week in the community, knocking doors, preaching the gospel to our church family. I keep telling our church people, I say, look, we've got about 100 soul winners that go out every week. We need to get that to about 120. I want to be like the, church, like the day of Pentecost, the, the upper room. Well, 120 soul winners going out preaching the gospel uh, uh, like they did on, on the day of Pentecost. But look, hey, we don't just want 100 soul winners to go out in their cars seeking. We want 100 soul winners going out in their cars on Sunday morning bringing their sheaves with them. Bringing them to be baptized. Developing relationships with them. Loving on them and praying for them and, and introducing them to people and discipling them in the things of God. Notice there in verse 6, the parable continues, And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. We need to seek those that are seeking. There is a call of the unsaved. Go over to the book of Acts, if you would. Acts chapter number 8. You're there in John. Just flip over to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 8. We see the call of the unsaved. What is it? It is a call to seek. It is the Greeks who say, we would see Jesus, 
I'd like to see Jesus. If you'd introduce me to Jesus, I'd sure like to meet him. Do you know that there's people in our communities? We live in such a secular world now. There are people in our communities, they've heard the name of Jesus, but they don't know anything about him. They've heard about the Bible, but they've never read it. They've never opened it. But there's people that are looking and searching, and our job is to seek for those that are seeking, to look for those that are looking. That means we don't wait for them to come to church. Look, we're not seeker sensitive like we talked about. Church is for saved people. Amen. Now sometimes unsaved people wander into our assemblies. That's okay. We'll get them saved after church. But church is for saved people. Amen. We're not waiting for them to come to us. We're looking for them. Amen. We're seeking for them. Amen. We're searching for them. What to God, Baptist churches all over this country would get a map and get a vision and decide I'm going to start knocking systematically every street in my neighborhood and every street in my community and every street in my zip code and every street in my city. And we're going to go house by house, street by street, the highways and hedges, Amen. seeking the law. Because there are people, you say, well, aren't there people out there that are upset? Aren't there people out there that slam the door on your face? Aren't there people out there that cuss at you? Aren't there people out you that say they're not interested? You know, that's why I don't like to go soul winning, because there's people out there that are rude to me. Try telling that story to Paul in heaven. You know, I just envisioned all, all of us in heaven, you know, we're all just kind of standing around sharing stories. Paul's talking about when he got beat when he got stoned, when he got imprisoned. And you're like, somebody slammed the door in my face one time. <laughs> That's why I quit, by the way. <laughs> look, there, look, most people are not looking, but there's some people that are looking. Most people are not seeking, but there are some people that are seeking. The call of the unsaved is to seek. Sir, we would see Jesus. But I'd like you to notice, secondly, tonight, not only is the call of the unsaved to seek, I'd like you to notice, secondly, here we have another story of an unsaved man. Acts chapter 8 and verse 29. Notice the Bible says, And the Spirit said unto Philip, Philip is the soul winner. Notice what the, fear, what the Spirit says to Philip. The Spirit says to Philip the same thing the Spirit says to all of us. Go. Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran hither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Here we have an unsaved man who's reading the Bible. He's going down the road. He's got the word of God. He's reading it. And Philip runs up to him and he asks this question. He says, Understandest thou what thou readest? Why don't you notice the response from the for Ethiopian eunuch here, verse 31. And he said, how can I? Do you know that unsaved people cannot understand the Bible? You know that unsaved people cannot understand the Bible on their own? The Bible says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolish unto him. Neither can he know them. He says, they're spiritually discerned. Unsaved people can't understand the Bible. If you don't believe me, just look at false religions. Amen. I mean, look at false religions. It's, it's always hilarious to me how backwards they get the Bible. I mean, look at the Roman Catholics. The disciples come to Jesus one day and they say, teach us to pray. And Jesus says, okay, I'm going to teach you to pray. In fact, I'm going to give you a pattern for prayer, an example for prayer. And Jesus says, but right before I start, though, right before I start, let me explain something to you. I don't want you to vainly repeat this prayer over and over. I don't want any vain or repetitious prayers like the heathen do. I'm going to give you this prayer, but I don't want you, Jesus said, I don't want you to just repeat it and chant it over and over. So, got it? So I will say, got it. Jesus begins. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven, he goes on and he gives them what we now refer to as the Lord's Prayer. The Catholic Church comes around and says, hey, I got a good idea. Let's repeat that one. <laughs> over and over. Let's just chant it. I mean, the exact opposite yeah, that's right. of what Jesus said. You say, how can you explain that? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Right. Right. Can somebody explain to me how the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that the 144,000 are the only ones that go to heaven when the Bible teaches the 144,000 come from heaven to earth. <laughs> Literally the exact opposite thing. Right. 
You say, how do you explain that? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Look, you can pass out as many John and Romans and tracts as you want. Unsaved people cannot understand the Bible. You say, what do they need? They need a soul winner. Notice there verse 31. And he said, how can I? Notice the call of the unsaved. Except some man should guide me. Notice the call of the unsaved is not only to seek. It's not just the Greeks that are saying we would, sir, we would see Jesus. But the call of the unsaved is also to study. Here, the Ethiopian eunuch, he said, how can I except some man should guide me? How can I except some soul winner would open up the Bible and show me from the Bible and explain it to me? And, and, and somebody would show me how to be saved. Notice verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. And by the way, he's reading about out of Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. He was led of the sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? Uh, uh, notice, for his life is taken from the earth. Notice verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, notice he doesn't understand. I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Isaiah 53 has given us one of the clearest prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this unsaved man who doesn't understand the Bible, who's looking for something, who's searching for something, who's reading Isaiah 53 because he knows he's missing out on something, he says, I don't understand. Is Isaiah talking about himself or is he talking about some other man? Yeah. Verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Amen. You know what the call of the unsaved is? The call of the unsaved is to seek. They say like the Greeks, we would see Jesus. But the call of the unsaved is also this, to study. Amen. The Bible says study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. I'm tired of soul winners giving the excuse. They say, and I'm not picking on you if this is you today. But soul winners say, well, I can't go soul winning because I don't know how to give the gospel. Well, then why don't you learn? Right. I can't go so in because I don't know how to present the gospel. Then why don't you study? Amen. Maybe it's time that you took some time to open up your Bible and take a highlighter and start highlighting some verses. Amen. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, John 3.16, Romans 5.8. Maybe it's time that you take the time to take a pen and write next to Romans 3.10 a number one. And, and, and next to Romans 3.10, right in, in small print, uh, Romans 3.23, so you know the next verse to go to. And right next to that verse, write a number two. And next to that verse, write Romans uh, 6.23, so you know the which one, next one to go to. And, 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 and go, so you say, well, that's going to take time. I know, it might take some study. That's right, right. Maybe it's time, maybe it's time you, you partnered up. With a, a, as a silent partner and you went out with someone who's already given the gospel, who's already explained the gospel, then you just decide, I'm going to listen and I'm going to learn and I'm going to try to understand what they're saying. I'm going to jot down some notes. Hey, why don't you study? There's a call of the unsaved that are out there who say, how can I except some man should guide me? Right. The call of the unsaved is to study. Look, we, uh, we got a soul winning seminar, uh, Verity Baptist Church. You go to our website, veritybaptist.com. We got a soul winning seminar on our, on our homepage, on our website. It's completely free to you. Ten lessons. We'll take you from the first step to following up on your visitors. We've got PDFs for filling the blanks. Look, I don't know how else to make it easy for you. We got videos with PDFs. You click on the PDF, you print it out, you watch the video. It's got filling the blanks. Maybe it's time to study. Right. Amen. Maybe it's time to take some time. Look, you can learn to give the gospel. You can learn to present the gospel. Look, it's not that complicated. If you're saved, you should be able to explain it. Amen. I think sometimes we overcomplicate these things. What is the gospel? The gospel, I mean, if you're going to present this to an unsaved person. What is it? We're, I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Your sin has a payment, which is death, which is hell. You're condemned to hell as a result of your sin. God has a gift He wants to give you. The gift is eternal life. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. Amen. In fact, somebody else paid for it. His name is Jesus Christ. Right. And once you have it, you can't lose it. Right. He'll never take it away. Okay. And all you have to do is call upon Him in faith to receive it. Right. 
I mean, six steps to explain the gospel to someone. Get a verse for each one of those steps. Highlight, hey, maybe it's time that you take the plan of Pastor Shelley with the little kids there and memorize one verse a week. Amen. And right, memorize the Romans road. And decide you're going to go. Here's all I'm telling you. There are unsaved people out there who are seeking. And they're calling like the Macedonian call and saying, we would see Jesus. If we would just seek those that are seeking. And there's a call of the unsaved like the Ethiopian eunuch. A call to study. How can I, he says, except some man should guide me. People get this idea. They say, well, I'll start going soul winning once I, you know, once I know all the answers to all the questions that I might possibly ever be asked. Well, you're not going soul winning. Let me let you know a little secret. All the pastors don't have the answers to every question that someone may possibly ever ask us. Now look, I think we, I, I, here's the truth though. You know that most of the questions we get asked are pretty much the same questions? I mean, every false religious pretty, religion pretty much teaches the same false doctrine. Adding works to salvation. Yeah. Look, you, you can, why don't you take the time to learn? The Bible says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Yeah. Why don't you take some time and learn? Just look, get some verses about the deity of Christ. Couple of verses. Get a couple of verses about work salvation. Get a couple of verses about eternal security. Get a couple of verses about uh, uh, repent of your sin. Get a couple of verses about the uh, literal hell. Jot those things down. Look, let, let me let you know a little secret. The Bible says this. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Amen. There you, go. you don't have to have every answer to every question. First of all, if somebody asks you a really complicated... Because people say, well, I, what if somebody asks me about Daniel's four, you know, 70th week? <laughs> or some really complicated question about the tribulation or something about revelation. I don't understand. Well, here's the thing. Look, even if you know the answer, don't get off on that rabbit's trail. All right. All right. All right. When you're, when, look, when, when you're out giving the gospel to somebody and somebody asks you some weird question, you just say, hey, yeah, let's get back to that later. Let, let me finish explaining the gospel to you. That's what I'm here for. That's right. I'm here seeking those that are seeking. That's right. And, and, and if it, it has to do with the gospel and, and, and you need to deal with the issue like the deity of Christ or whatever, look, all you need is two verses. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Right. Somebody says, I don't, I don't believe in the deity of Christ and you show them a verse on the deity of Christ. They're like, ah, I don't know if I still believe it. You give, show them a second verse. And, and they're like, ah, I still don't believe it. Then you say, God bless you. Have a good day. And you, and you find someone who's actually interested. Yeah. Right. That's right. Now look, if they're listening and they're being receptive, you've got to use your common sense. Obviously, if somebody wants to hear it and you're just trying to, maybe they were raised in a certain way and it's hard for them to grasp it. You work with that person and work with that person. But look, your job is not to go out there and argue with people. That's right. Right. Preach it. We're seeking those that are seeking. We're looking for those that are looking. But at the same time, let's study. Amen. Let's be ready. You only need a proof verse for some of the major questions. Get those proof verses and then you can uh, go out and preach the gospel. Here's all I'm saying. There are unsaved people. There are unsaved people in your neighborhood, in the city you live in. There are unsaved people out there who are looking and searching for the truth. And the call of the unsaved, the Macedonian call, the Philippian jailer, the, the Greeks at the feast, the call of the unsaved, those that would say, Sir, sir, I, we would see Jesus. The call of the unsaved is to seek. But the call of the unsaved is not only to seek, the call of the unsaved is also to study. How can I, except some man, should guide me? Go back to John chapter 5 if you would. John chapter 5. Let me give you the third one tonight. We're talking about the call of the unsaved. You know the unsaved are calling for you tonight? They're calling for you to seek. They're calling for you to study. In John chapter 5 we have one of these interesting stories. We have a story where Jesus asks a very critical question. Now, please understand what I'm about to say, because I love the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. We have all love and respect for the Lord Jesus Christ. But have you ever noticed that sometimes Jesus, he asks these kind of critical questions, 
And when I say critical, I mean it in two, in two ideas. Critical because they're very important, but critical because it's kind of, it's kind of a criticism. Now notice, notice John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethsaida, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. The word impotent means lacking power or strength of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Notice this, these words, verse 5. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Now I want you to notice that in the story we have this interesting story because it's like a it's like a a, 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 a a miraculous lottery. I mean, we and the, and the narrator of the book is telling us this is the case, so I believe it to be true. There's this pool, and it, God would allow for these miracles where an angel would come down and trouble the water, and anybody that got into the water would be healed of their physical ailment. And of course, when people began to hear about this, these multitudes of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, would come and they would surround themselves around this pool, waiting and hoping that they could go in when the angel would trouble the water. Jesus, in verse 6, notice, when Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been there now a long time in that case. He saith unto him. I want you to notice the critical question of Christ. He says, imagine this. I mean, Jesus can get away with this because Jesus is God. You and I might not say this to somebody. He says, wilt thou be made whole? Now here's what Jesus is saying. Wilt thou, well, the word wilt means, do you want to? Are you willing he says, wilt thou be made whole? In our modern vernacular, here's how we would say it. We would say, do you want to be healed? And you and I might, add, you know, we might say, well, what kind of question is that? I've been impotent for 38 years. I'm laying here, obviously, for a reason. What do you mean? Do you want to be whole? Now, please understand something. Jesus never asked a question he doesn't know the answer to. Amen. And usually, usually when Jesus asks a question, he asks the question because he's trying to make a point. And, he, and, he, and he's trying to bring forth the truth and, 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 and pinpoint a truth. And he's asking this man, he says, Wilt thou be made whole? He says, Do you want to be whole? And what he's really asking is he's saying, Hey guy, what's the problem? What's the issue here? I mean, you, you know you can be made whole, right? Well, why are you still impotent? Why are you still blind? Why are you still whole? Why are you still suffering with these things? He says, wilt thou be made whole? What's the problem? And I want you to notice the answer. Jesus asks a critical question, and we get a heartbreaking response. In verse 7, the impotent man answered him. Now, I want you to notice something. When we started the sermon, we started with the example of the Greeks. And I told you at that example that you have five of maybe the most, some of the most encouraging words in the Bible. I asked you to underline them. We have the Greeks, and this should excite us that there are unsaved people out there that would say, Sir, we would see Jesus. In this story, we have five of maybe the saddest words in the Bible. In fact, I'd like you to underline them. If you don't mind writing in your Bible, I'd like you to circle them. Jesus asked this question. He says, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him. And he gives these five words, these side, the sad words. He says, Sir, I have no man. Jesus looks at this man. He says, What's the problem? 
And this impotent man, 38 years, lying there, he says, well, what do you mean what's the problem? Look around. There's like a hundred people here. And, 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 and that guy's brother isn't even sick. He's just, he's just waiting so that when the angel troubles the water, he can pick up his brother and throw him in the water before the rest of us can get in here. And you see that guy over there? That guy's not sick either. He's, he's sitting next to his wife, and he's just waiting for when the well, angel troubles the water. He's, he, he's going to pick up his wife and throw in that water and heal her. And, and, and you see over there? That's, that's, a, that's a mom with, with her little girl over there, and she's, she's waiting for somebody uh, uh, when the water is troubled to put him in the water. And he says, you're asking me what the problem is. The problem is, sir, I have no man. I don't have anybody who cares about me enough to help me. I don't have anybody who cares enough about me to be, uh, bring me somewhere that might heal me. I don't have, I have, the problem is I don't have anybody. I want you to notice that the unsaved is not just a call to seek. The unsaved is not just a call to study. The unsaved also has a call to sympathize. A call to care. You know why we don't seek you know why we don't go out and knock doors and look for unsaved people? Because we just don't care. Because we'd rather do our gardening on Saturday morning. Because we'd rather, I've had a tough week and, you know, Saturday's my day to sleep in. Well, you know what? They're going to have a tough week when they die and go to hell. You know there's unsaved people out there who say, man, I'm not just looking for something and I don't just need somebody to study. They're just saying, I just need some help. They're saying, sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another step it down before me. Jesus said unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. You know that there's unsaved people out there that have no man? They just need help. I'm thinking of a young man just this last Sunday. We had a, a young man, another family, not my wife. This is another family, went out on Sunday morning and they picked somebody up, one of their converts. They had a young man get saved on Saturday and they went out and picked him up uh, uh, for church. And they picked him up. He, he uh, apparently wa wasn't saved. So after the service, one of our personal workers got him saved on Sunday morning after the service. And our personal worker talked to him about baptism. And he said, yes, I'll come back tonight and I'll get baptized. And he came back on Sunday night and he brought his mom. Brought his mom to see him get baptized on Sunday night. And his mom was so happy. And, and, and it turns out this young man had, presently, had, 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 had just recently got out of jail. He's a young man, I don't know, 24, 25 years old. And he was uh, telling uh, uh, some of the guys there that, that he just got out of jail. And his mom was very worried. His mom was very worried because this is now his second strike. I don't know how it is here in Georgia or other states. I don't know if there's a federal thing, but in California, if you, it's three strikes and you're out. It doesn't really matter what your third strike is. It could be a small thing, but once you've had three of them, you get 25 years in prison. And his mom was worried for him, and she was excited that he was coming to church and that he was going to get uh, baptized and, and, and all those things. And at our church, we've got some guys that have been in prison, and they went out and were reaching out to them. And I, I, I was talking to the mom as I was listening to these guys talking. They were exchanging phone numbers, and they were saying, hey, we, we're going to pray for you. and Don't worry about that. We're going to help you. And you're gonna... But he, he was saying, he, he was telling them, he was telling them, yes, my mom is very excited that I'm coming to church because all my friends, all my friends have, are pretty much in prison or in the same state that I am. All my cousins and all my family, it's all the same thing. They're all just in, in, in crime and, and drugs and, 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 and gang banging and, and all these things. And, 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 and he said, you know, I just don't have anybody that's, ha that, that's going in my life that's going in the right direction. He said, I just don't have anybody in my life that, 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 that's helping me go in the right direction. You know what he was saying? He was saying, sir, I have no man. Right. He's saying if there's just somebody, look, there are people in your neighborhood, there are people in your community that just need help. I'm thinking about the single mother that got pregnant when she was a teenage girl and she wasn't even saved and she just needs help. We're obviously against fornication and we preach against fornication. But when people sin and they get saved and they realize it's a sin, we, we need to be there to help them. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the man that just got out of prison. I'm talking about the family that just had their family, their kids taken by CPS. I'm talking about the marriages that are struggling and heading for divorce. I'm just telling you there are people out there. They are seeking. They need someone to find them because they're in trouble. This man says, 
Sir, I have no man. I have no man. This man says, I just need someone to care. Can I give you a testimony tonight? I'm a very fortunate man. The Bible says in Psalm 16, 6, this is what David said. He said, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. You know, I can claim, I'm, I'm talking about me personally, I can claim that verse tonight. I was saved when I was just a little boy, very young. I was raised in an independent fundamental Baptist church. I went soul winning before I was even saved. <laughs> I, 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 I just remember going soul winning my whole life with my dad and just going soul winning and knocking doors as, as a kid. I can say, like uh, David here, the lines are falling unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly heritage. You know, I'll tell you the truth, Pastor Shelley uh, joked about it uh, 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 tonight, but I, I can tell you the honest truth. I never, growing up, saw my parents fight. Never once. I don't have any memory of my parents ever arguing or fighting. I'm not saying they didn't fight. They just had enough sense to not do it in front of us. Amen. I mean, I, I just, the lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I always think it's funny. Sometimes people try to, try to uh, you know, what's, what's the, 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 the phrase? Uh, throw shade. Sometimes people try to throw shade on, 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 on my, my, my wife and I. Or, or people like Pastor Anderson. You know, sometimes people will, will look at us and say, Oh, you guys don't have a history. Like, that's a bad thing. Right. You just don't have this testimony of sin. Hey, that's a good thing. Amen. Yeah, that's right. It's a good thing that children are raised in homes where mom and dad, like we heard tonight, love each other, where, where men love their wives and wives submit to their husband and they're raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's a good thing. Amen. But I'm here to tell you that some of us, some of us have been given much. Some of us have been highly blessed. Some of us, I mean, the, 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 the odds were stacked in our favor to be saved, to be used of God in a mighty way. But that's not the story that every man has. Some men would say, sir, I have no man. I didn't have a dad that cared. I didn't have a dad that was there. I didn't have a dad that was present. I, I, didn't, I had a mom that was a drug addict. I had a mom that would, would bring different men into the house just uh, on a regular basis. I, I have no man. And they just need somebody that would care. Somebody that would care enough to remember their name. Somebody that would care enough to pick them up for church on Sunday. Somebody that would care enough to bring them back on Sunday so they could get baptized. Somebody that would care enough to write down their phone number and give them a call and take them out to eat. Somebody that would care enough to put them on, the pray on their prayer list and pray for them. There are people out there who just need somebody to care. And we've been given so much. You know, when we hide the gospel, we hurt those who need it the most. The Bible says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The truth is, I've been given much. I'm saved. Everyone in my immediate family is saved. My wife is saved. My children are saved. My parents are saved. My siblings are saved. They all attend my church. The church I pastor. All my close friends are, go to my church or are in a good church somewhere. Honestly, if I never went out on a Saturday morning and preached the gospel to anybody, it wouldn't affect me one bit. But there are people out there that have not been blessed like you and I have been blessed. There are people out there that are seeking and we must seek for those that are seeking. We must look for those that are looking. The call of the unsaved is like the Greeks who said, Sir, we would see Jesus. The call of the unsaved is like the Ethiopian eunuch who said, How can I accept some man? Should guide me? The call of the unsaved is like this impotent man who said, Sir, you want to know what the problem is? I have no man. I have no man. You and I have been blessed. You and I have been blessed. People often try to tell me, ah, I can't be done. Everywhere I go, people tell me about California. California this and California that, and I get it. Look, California's a hellhole. <laughs> so is Georgia. <laughs> I'll remind you that you're the ones that gave us Joe Biden. You know the gospel works anywhere? 
Amen. You know, the gospel works everywhere. Amen. People say, oh, you can't go soul in California. Nobody there it will get saved. You're just not looking hard enough. You'll find them. Amen. You just go out consistently and look and to seek and to save. You'll find them. I, I got this email. I was, I was working on this sermon and this email came in. I got this email this week. By the grace of God, we get lots of emails like this and, and we appreciate them. I'd like to just read it. I won't read you the whole thing. I'll just read you a little bit of it. It says this, Dear VBC, I think this email is long overdue because I've been feeling the need to write this for a while now. I just want to share a few of the things that God is doing here in Romania and how you have helped. First of all, I was personally moved by Pastor Jimenez's sermon from the RHPC 2019 when I was there and how pastors answer make an uproar which is a sermon I preached that year to my qu question how can we do something great in Romania it really stayed with me up until now I may have seemed like a shy person but God was moving every step of the way in my trip to Sacramento that year it was a huge blessing and I want to thank you again for it anyway the following months God has led me to what I now believe is the best church in my city in the capital of Romania and a long story short God has started since a soul winning movement here that is growing month by month teenagers young adults and missionaries led by our soul winning leader are going out every week and preach to the young generation the gospel with great success we are amazed every week to see God orchestrate and lead us in His work. There is also a teen activity here that focuses on preaching prayer and finally going out there to preach, which is going really well. All this time I've been encouraged by your weekly sermons with the special mention of Job 8, the one on assumptions, each one helping me to grow and change my life for the better. So thank you uh, very much. He says, uh, I'll skip some of these things, he says, so those were some of the things that God has been doing here. I have much, much more to write, but I know you're busy, so I hope you were encouraged. Please pray for us here in Romania. I feel like God is really moving the souls of His people to do great things for Him. I will continue to pray for you as well. Keep fighting the good fight. God bless you abundantly and give you His amazing grace. And He signs His name. Let me tell you something. It can be done anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. People would say, ah, oh, Romania, just forget about Romania. One soul winner can get fired up for the things of God and just say, I'm going to seek, I'm going to study, I'm going to sympathize, I'm going to go, I'm going to care, and God can use them. Amen. God can use you. God can use me. You say, Pastor Jimenez, what's the call of the unsaved? It's a call to seek. Sir, we would see Jesus. What's the call of the unsaved? It's a call to study. How can I, except some man, should guide me? And by the way, let me say this to you church members. Some of you need to study to show thyself to prove them to God as well. Don't you love these events that our churches put on? I'll tell you something about Baptists, especially the new IFB. We sure know how to throw a party. I mean, good night, look at this place. This is free. It wasn't free, it cost Stronghold Baptist Church a lot of money. But, you know, so most churches, they're charging you 200 bucks because of something like this. Yeah. Right. People will come to events like this. They'll come to the Red Hot Preaching Conference. They'll go to a soul winning marathons we put on. Free breakfast, free lunch, free resources. They come to our churches. DVDs and CDs and anything and everything you could want. We'll never make the house of God a house of merchandise. Right. And, and while things are good, they'll come, to, they'll come to camp meetings just like this one. They'll come and enjoy it. They'll love it. They're like, yeah, the new IP, everything's great, absolutely. Till persecution starts. Till the news media shows up. Till the protesters show up. When the protesters show up, all of a sudden it's, well, I, I, kinda may, I thought maybe the homosexuals could be saved. Really? Well, I, I don't think they should be put to death. Well, maybe you should study to show thyself to prove unto God. Yeah. The Bible says if a man also lies with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abom abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Amen. Their blood shall be upon them. That's what the Bible says. Some of you church people just need to spend some time studying and figuring out, look, we as the pastors, we're not perfect, but we're not getting up here and preaching what we think. You know, we preach these things, we preach, and people are like, amen, amen, amen. And then the news media shows up and they're like, Pastor, were you serious? 
airplane. You weren't? Well, I might lose my job. And they go off running like a dog with a tail between its legs. Why don't you study a little bit and decide what you believe? Amen. Why don't you study a little bit and decide who you are? Yeah, you want to come and join our, our, our conferences and our camps and all our free events because we know how to put on a party, but we also know how to fight. Amen. We also know how to stand up and, and earnestly contend for the faith. Amen. You got to decide. Look, you got to be lawyer or pastor. I get sick and tired of these, these, these people who say, oh, well, the pastor, he did something I didn't like. Let me let you in on a little secret. I've been pastoring now for 10 years. I've got a little bit of experience. Maybe I can help you out with something. I don't know if the other pastors would agree with me, but I'll just give you my personal testimony. People get mad at us and say, the pastor did something I didn't like. You know that church people do stuff we don't like all the time? <laughs> I mean, virtually every week, a week doesn't go by that somebody in our church doesn't make some stupid decision we don't like. Do we quit on you? Do we give up on you? Do we turn on you? Do we start sending uh, uh, angry emails about you and text messages about you and making YouTube channels all about you? Is that what we do to you? Yeah. We, need, we need a little loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. We need a little studying of the Word of God and deciding, hey, this is the Word of God. That's the man of God. This is the house of God. I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. I'm not going to show up to a camping trip when things are fun and run away like a coward when the fight's on. Right. Yeah. I'm going to study to show myself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here's all I'm telling you. The unsaved, the unsaved are calling tonight. They're calling for you. I think it's funny when people say, oh, well, I, didn't, I, didn't I don't have the gift of evangelism. I didn't get the gift of preaching. God didn't call me. Well, let me tell you something. Number one, God did call you when he said go. That's right. But maybe you didn't know it. The unsaved are calling for you tonight. Good. The unsaved are calling for you. Sir, we would see Jesus. Yes. The call to seek. How can I except some man should guide me? The call to study. And lastly, the call for someone to care. Sir, sir, I have no man. I have no man to help me. I have no man to care for me. I have no man to bring me the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Jude 1, and 23 says this, And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Here's the question for you tonight. Do you care? Do you care? Will you answer the call of the unsaved? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for these dear people. Lord, thank you for the fact that somebody didn't drop the ball on us. No matter what our history is, we were all unsaved at some point. At one point, we all needed the gospel, and somebody gave it to us. Somebody cared enough to reach us with the gospel, and Lord, I pray that you would start a fire for soul winning in the hearts of these dear people, that you start a fire for soul winning in my heart and in the heart of our people back in Sacramento, Lord, that we might go and seek and save that which was lost. Help us, Lord, not to be deaf to the call of the unsaved. Help us to sympathize with them, empathize with them, care about them. Care enough to study and care enough to go. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.